Okay, just to uh, just to introduce our uh, our next uh, lecture. Uh, this is the uh, I read it just twelfth annual uh, Clara and Frank Gert Gertler lecture in medicine, and uh, I just want to say a few things about the uh, the uh, Gertler lecture. This is actually the name Clara and Frank Gertler are the parents of uh, Dr. Menard Gertler, who uh, was born in uh, Saskatoon and did some uh, of his undergraduate degree at the University of Saskatchewan. Dr. Gertler actually died just over a year ago in New York. And uh, thanks to Robin Lumsden, I uh, was able to look up his obituary published in the New York Times in May of last year. Uh, he was an, uh, uh, quite an amazing uh, physician and had a quite a distinguished career with many awards. Uh, after uh, doing his undergraduate at the university here, he went to McGill and uh, he got his metal, medical degree at McGill in the 1940s. And he worked with some very uh, well-known physicians, one Wilder Penfield, uh, 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 one of the one of the giants of uh, Canadian medicine in the uh, in the uh, 19th, uh, 20th century, and uh, at that time he actually apparently produced a model of the human brain, a plastic model. But he actually went on to become a a, a cardiology uh, uh, specialist, and he worked with some of the pioneering uh, surgeons and cardiologists of the last century. He uh, produced a book with uh, Arthur Weinberg, uh, I think related to the Weinberg procedure, which has still been carried out, I think, for many years. And uh, he worked with uh, Paul White at Harvard and Massachusetts General Hospital. And apparently, he also wrote a book called um, Predict, you, oh, You Can Predict Your Heart Attack and Prevent It. In, and published in 1961, and his wife, Anna Gertler, actually translated it into lay language from his original manuscript, so it was much more understandable by the regular public. Um, eventually, he uh, worked and taught medicine at McGill, Harvard, New York University, Columbia, and Cornell. So he had quite an amazing, uh, quite an amazing career. So it's, I'm very proud to say that uh, for this year, uh, we have a equally distinguished uh, speaker from uh, Hamilton, Dr. Jack Goldie, who is going to talk on gene transfer techniques and related to immunotherapy and cancer, a very leading cutting edge uh, topic. And uh, he has been the uh, professor uh, at Department in Pathology and Molecular Medicine at McMaster University, but he's also been uh, Vice President of Research and Director of the Research Institute at St. Joseph's Hospital in Hamilton, and he's been on, uh, he's, he's been, he's written or been a, a, a part of the uh, article or book chapter in 370 published uh, uh, articles. He also, I note, is a fellow of a very distinguished society, the Royal Society of Canada. And uh, there are not many people get to uh, have that honor. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Jack Goldie. So thank you very much uh, uh, for the introduction, and thanks for the uh, invite to uh, to participate in uh, in your reunions. I uh, I had my 50th back at McMaster just two years ago, and it, uh, it it's a continual amount of fun. Uh, you see the same faces, and uh, and and it's a very enjoyable situation that uh, I'm hoping you will uh, continue to to do even after the end of the of this particular lecture. Um, this is uh, an area that I want to talk about, but I, I look around the room and I see that quite a few of you have the same color hair as I do, uh, which means that you were really exposed to your immunology learning quite a number of years ago. Um, 
which, uh, if I tell you that my, uh, my background was in chemistry and physics, and I didn't actually enter into immunology until about 1971. And at that time, uh, we knew most about immunology by studying chickens. But Robert Good had told us that the lymphocyte we now call the T cell was the lymphocyte that matured in the thymus, because when you whipped out the chicken's thymus, it didn't have any cell-mediated immunity. And uh, the one we now call the B cell, which derives the antibody-producing cell, uh, was the bursa cell, because if you whipped out the chicken's bursa, uh, it no longer was able to mount an, uh, an antibody response. So B cells and T cells have a different meaning then than they do now. Uh, there's been dramatic movement, uh, moving into the mouse where we learn most of our stuff in, in immunology. But I can tell you that immunology is no different than cell biology, but it's read by a different language. And it's until you get to grips with the fact that you've got a language barrier, immunology can be very confusing. Uh, but in actual fact, it's not. So hopefully I can take a few through things. I will try not to enter into any of the languages associated with uh, with basic science uh, discussion in, in uh, immunology. But this is an area that is, has really begun to explode. And it's the understanding of how we may be able to use the most potent uh, armament that we have as humans, which is our immune response. And if we can direct that immune response against the invader, which is uh, a tumor, uh, then potentially we have a way of not only eradicating it, but providing what is the best part, which would be provide ongoing protection against any metastatic or any recurrence of that individual tumor. You're, you're, in your practices, I'm sure you're all aware that chemotherapy has worked, is working, and has been uh, developed very, very uh, well over the last 10 to 15 years. But the side effects associated with chemotherapy and tumor uh, treatments are very severe, um, and one hopes that if we can harness the power of the immune response correctly, target it towards the tumors, uh, then that's the way in which, in a much more benign manner, we'll be able to either control or manage cancer, or in fact, in many cases, hopefully, can eradicate it. So this is uh, just a, a trip, a little bit of a historical trip. I'll tell you a lot more about uh, the individuals, uh, the, the work from the individuals who have contributed to this. There are four people at McMaster currently heavily involved in, in the development of immunotherapy approaches. Uh, at Ottawa, there's Dr. John Bell, and you hear about his work in oncolytic viruses, and David Stoidel at uh, CHEO, uh, and Byron Bridal at uh, Guelph. But this is, so what I'll describe is a lot of their work over the la last little period of time. Uh, but recognize that this is only an example of what's going on across the country, uh, throughout North America and in Europe, where people are very heavily now engaged in understanding how we can uh, harness the immune response and target it towards tumors. Um, there's been some startling uh, successes that I'll tell you a little bit about, uh, which actually has rejuvenated the whole uh, approach to trying to develop uh, uh, this kind of an approach in order to... Uh, to eradicate or at least control uh, what tumors do. So here's the problem. If you look at a tumor and you look at 10 tumors or 20 tumors and you take biopsies and you stain it appropriately, what you see is on, in the blue is, is tumor cells. These are two different tumors from two different individuals. And in the brown uh, is uh, we're staining for lymphocytes. We're staining for cells that should be capable of, of dealing with the tumor. And you can see that there are two different approaches there, two different types of response. And yet in both situations, while there are many, many lymphocytes present, nothing happens. The tumor still grows. Now we know that if we take the tumor out and if we separate those cells in the culture in, in, uh, in the laboratory, and we take the tumor cells and we take the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, those brown cells, and if we manipulate them carefully uh, in the laboratory and we put them back together in the laboratory, we can know that we can see those lymphocytes will kill the tumor. So there is the ability to recognize and kill a tumor, but the inability to manifest that in vivo. We cannot get that cell to correctly recognize and kill the tumor. So this has now been a conundrum that's been present in, in tumor 
uh, biology for 25 or 30 years. We knew these cells were there. We knew that if we were able to manipulate them, they may well kill that tumor um, in, in some situations, but we were confronted with this uh, entire situation and others who do not mount much of an immune response against a tumor. So it, it said that there is an issue here where if we can correctly understand what are the blockades and what is stopping those individual cells from uh, attacking a tumor, then we may be able to um, uh, modify the uh, host response and get uh, management under control. Now, a number of years ago, there was a postulate made which said that malignant cells arise all the time but are uh, recognized and cleared by the immune system. This is probably a very reasonable hypothesis uh, because we undergo somatic mutations many, many times uh, during our lifetime. Uh, there's very reasonable expectations that we emerge every now and again a tumor cell uh, just by chance and uh, also a reasonable expectation that our immune response may recognize it and wipe it out. That's reasonable. But if you look at the corollary to that, it says that if you have a failure of the immune response to clear these malignant cells, then it can lead to tumor formation. Taking those two together, that means we may be able to modify that. If we can actually prove that it, the immune system can clear, um, and we can do it in mice. In fact, we've cured cancers, thousands of mice. Um, you can't do it in the human, but you can certainly do it in the mouse. So the principles are proven in the mouse, and now we have to move that into the human. That's where the big barriers that have occurred in over the last 20, 20 years in, uh, in doing this. So I want to take us back a little bit to try and get the wording right so that we understand the, the systems we're talking about. Uh, you can see these are the cells in the peripheral blood circulation, the lymphocyte, the monocyte, the granulocyte. Those are the ones that we usually understand. But then there's another cell population that, that we're going to talk a lot about, uh, which is the, the intermediate the cell, the dendritic cell. Uh, this is the cell that was first discovered by Ralph Steinman. Ralph Steinman was a Canadian um, who ended up working in, did it all his uh, training at McGill, ended up working at the Rockefeller um, in the United States. He discovered the dendritic cell for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize uh, just about uh, eight years ago. Uh, he's the only person, first of all, he's the only Canadian who's got a good Nobel Prize in cell biology like this. Uh, but more importantly, he's the only individual who actually got his prize posthumously. He, um, he was awarded it by the committee, at least the committee made their decision on a Friday. Uh, he died on a Sunday before they could contact him on the Monday. And they, because the Nobel Prize is not allowed to be awarded to anybody after they're dead, uh, but uh, they did the consideration said they actually awarded him while he was alive, and unfortunately he died before he got it. So his family got the Nobel Prize in, uh, in absentia. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's a very proud mo moment in Canadian science, and certainly in Canadian immunology, that uh, somebody uh, has made a, a basic discovery. And this is a very basic discovery. The cell population of the dendritic cell is the cell that is the primary cell that sees the foreign pieces that come into us, whether it's a virus, a bacteria, or whatever. And it processes those foreign um, aspects, and it presents the, the aspects of that to the immune system. It's the primary cell that recognizes foreignness, deals with it, breaks it apart, and now presents it to the immune response. And it does it in very highly contiguous manner. You can see the dendritic cell and the lymphocyte and that's the killer cell that we're going to try and derive. So we know now definitely that we need to get the dendritic cell and the killer cell together in order to uh, allow that killer cell to be educated and allow that killer cell now to move into uh, recognizing a tumor. So how do we know all this and why is it important in, in tumor biology? Well, if you take a little bit of a step Side. We know this is for fact, and we proved it in, in both the animal species as well as the human. That is, if you have an appropriately marked killer cell, that you've trained it, it's got a specificity against, for example, a virus, that killer cell will knock out virally infected cells. That's our well-known response after you get a viral infection. So that killer T cell is capable of killing that cell. And we also know that it doesn't kill normal cells. So we've got specificity and we've got capacity. So how do we get to that stage? What do we need to know about the last 15 years or 20 years of investigation to really come to grips with how this works? 
Well, we know that uh, a virus getting into a cell population affects that cell population. It causes those cells to express some viral antigens, the things that will stimulate the immune response. And those antigens are presented into the dendritic cells such that they express themselves on the surface of the dendritic cell. And in, in communication then with that CD8 T cell, there are materials released by the dendritic cell. We call them cytokines. These are small hormone-like molecules that will stimulate the ability of the T cell to proliferate. Um, and, and activating that, the, those cells become educated and they will then be capable of wiping out the virally infected cell. So as a sequence, we need the, uh, the dendritic cells involved. We need them to communicate directly with the T cell, educate and license the T cell, and now the T cell is going to go and kill the, uh, the virus infected cell. That's been learning capacity for in, in uh, virology over the past 25 years, where we know exactly now what kind of cells will control viral infections. And when, you, when, you, when we've looked at this, it's quite clear that there's no such thing as immunology separate from cell biology, separate from molecular biology, and separate from molecular virology. All of those four disciplines all together come together when we begin to explain the simple act of being protected against a, a viral infection. So there's, there's a communication across disciplines that has occurred over those last numbers of years, which really does leave us Again, not battling a language barrier of trying to understand what a, a T cell is or a B cell. So, why is that important? Well, it's important because tumors also express antigens. We've known that for many, many years. Uh, prostate specific antigen, your PSA in the circulation, is an indication, for example, in prostate cancer of an antigen that is present in normal cells but not very high in density, but if in very high levels can act as a target for immune responses. That's just one example. There are many, many examples now uh, of what a tumor antigen is. And therefore, if we can understand how we've generated specificity against viral antigens, we should be able to use that same information to try and drive specificity against tumor antigens. So what is a tumor antigen? Well, tumor antigen, once a cell becomes a tumor, it begins to express internally a variety of abnormal proteins or overexpress normal proteins. And those are presented on the surface of that tumor cell. They're presented in the context of the, of the MHC, uh, major histocompatibility locus of that cell. And along comes then our primed killer T cell. And the primed killer T cell will interact with that same antigen, bind to the tumor cell, and begin to release a variety of components. It releases, for example, interferon gamma a molecule that has been tried in many cases to be an anti-cancer uh, agent. Uh, TNF-alpha, a tumor necrosis factor alpha, a, a molecule that uh, is quite capable of causing destruction of other cell populations. And then it can also release cytolytic mediators, granzyme A and granzyme B or perforin. These are molecules that will interrupt the cell membrane of the tumor and cause lysis of the tumor or oncolysis. So, this is, we've got pretty powerful armamentum in the, in the prime T cell population, and we know for definite that the tumor antigens exist and can be expressed on the outside of tumors. That's, we know, can be mimicked in the pictures that we already saw in the, in the photomicrograph. We have T cells adjacent to tumor cells, but unfortunately, these pri primary mechanisms are not working at this point in time. So, <clears throat> Back to the conundrum that we first uh, expressed. We know we have killer cells present. We know that they will kill some of the tumors, but unfortunately, they don't kill all the tumors. Something happens that they are not uh, able to deal with that. The tumor keeps growing, and the tumor keeps growing. So we've got everything right. At least we have everything in place right, but we have not got an understanding of what goes on uh, to stop that system going. Uh, about 15 years ago, there was a lot of work done, um, again, in very basic mechanisms, so using mouse um, to ask the question. And the question that was asked was not what does a, a uh, cytotoxic T cell or, or killer T cell do to a tumor, but rather what does a tumor do back to a cytotoxic T cell? What does the microenvironment of a tumor do when that T cell appears in the neighborhood? So it began to understand that it was always a two-way street. 
So we, we, we were always trying to think our way into the tumor when in fact the tumor was trying to think its way of blocking that entry into the tumor. And that's many of the mechanisms that have evolved and understanding right now is that the tumor can, is capable of blunting that immune response, that T cell population. And in fact, we can consider that to be a blinded T cell. It's got all the capacities, but it, but it can't see past the fact that there is an antigen there, but I cannot activate my mechanisms of cytolytic activity. And that's absolutely due to materials or, or aspects that, have, that are expressed by the tumors. The tumors themselves are capable of expressing things that will block that and blind the, t the killer T cell, both in vitro if we do this in culture and really and truly in vivo uh, in situ in the tumors themselves. So that is now where we are going to try and modify our behavior. We're going to try and unblind those T cells and stop the blockade between the things. So this is the renaissance of immunotherapy. Um, Actually, immunotherapy has been there a long, long time. I don't know if any of you ever had uh, Coley's uh, vaccine, which is basically a, a bacterial cell wall vaccine that, that has been used on a number of occasions. Uh, for example, it's been BCG has been used in bladder cancer. Um, it's also a bacterial cell wall. Um, and, and this is a simple way of stimulating inflammation, which in some cases has the capacity to unblock that blinding that we know that goes on in the tumors. Inflammation by itself can do this, uh, but we don't know how to harness it. And indeed, the, the early discoveries, as you see, there's Steinman's discovery of the dendritic cell. The early discoveries really didn't go anywhere. And there was this enthusiasm phase, which was followed by the skepticism, really heavy skepticism. We'll never be able to do it. We've tried it. We tried to do it in mouse. We haven't been able to get it. We certainly aren't going to get it in the human. But about 1992 or 93 there really were results beginning to emerge uh, and understanding that emerged, which allowed us to open up, again, questions about whether or not we can stimulate the immune response in tumor-bearing individuals and have that begin to, uh, to uh, manage, if you like, the tumor growth there. So there is a renaissance. I'll take you through some of the, 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 the trials that, that have gone on, uh, what's gone on in, uh, in our thinking, and then bring you hopefully up to speed to about 2015 because between 2010 and 2015, there was a magnificent developments that have gone on in our understanding and some new materials that undoubtedly in your practice, you may well have patients who are being exposed to, uh, to these, um, which were basically the ability to modify the immune response in, the, in, in tumors. So. So Coley's toxin, BCG, uh, was capable by putting inflammatory signals. These were molecules that came out of, uh, out of a stimulated cell, a macrophage, a neutrophil, uh, molecules like uh, interleukin-1-beta, tumor necrosis factor. Um, these are cytokines, or hormone-like molecules, which actually can bypass some of the blinding and activate uh, individual T cells. But they were very limited. Not, a, not very real in terms of, of broad spectrum activity, but in some cancers, it was quite clear that it had the capacity to stimulate uh, the, the host response and, and m at least manage those individual cancers. We knew the molecules that were being released had the capacity to stimulate the immune response. And about 1985 to 1990, a lot of uh, excitement came along about the molecule interleukin-2. It was a molecule which we knew interacted with T cells, caused T cells to proliferate, caused them to expand. And so the thought was, if we take interleukin-2 and administer it, um, could we in fact get a, an enhanced immune response against, uh, against the tumors that were there? The fact is that interleukin-2 is a small molecule. If you administer it, it had a half-life of probably about 27 hours in, the, in circulation. And under those conditions, it didn't last very long. So um, uh, a number of places then began to, under, to undertake a different approach. A different approach was to use our knowledge of virology to create mechanisms where we would use viruses to carry in to the host uh, messages like interleukin-2 and use those uh, to generate a prolonged exposure. Let me take that through to you. 
So this is adenovirus, adenovirus 5. And adenovirus 5 is a common cold virus. We've all got it. We've all got immunity to it. Uh, I don't think if we surveyed anybody in the room, we'd find anybody who was not immune to adeno 5. Uh, common cold itself, uh, but if you take the individual DNA, it's a uh, double-stranded DNA, out of it, you see on the bottom there, from the five prime end to the three prime end, there are two regions that are very important in that genome, the E1 region and E3 region. Now I have a colleague at uh, McMaster University, Frank Graham, um, who uh, was able to manipulate this genome, ran, uh, take out the E1 region, take out the E3 region, and reconstruct a virus, but it could not replicate. E1 was absolutely required for replication. So we now have a virus with space in it that can infect and carry into a cell, just like a nascent virus, but will not replicate. If you then insert back into that genome the genetic information, for example, for an interleukin-2 gene, that then becomes a vehicle for putting into the host interleukin-2 capacity to make it, and it makes it over a prolonged period of time, a period of seven to ten days. So we constructed a vector that made the interleukin-2 gene, and then administered in the clinical trial, the first clinical trial in, in the country in gene therapy in cancer, and this is just a photograph of uh, a first patient. This was 1996. Uh, uh, Christine Addison is the student at the back who made the vector, and Frank Graham is the one in the front uh, holding the hand. I'm just in the back uh, holding up myself. Um, th this was a very significant uh, activity for us. Uh, we were involved primarily in basic research, not necessarily in clinical research, but this is the first time we were able to take something so-called from the bench to the bedside. It was uh, an important clinical trial for us because it was our first, uh, but it also gave us a bit of confidence. Confidence that effectively we were doing now human investigation uh, we were able to understand that we had a relatively safe approach going on. We didn't achieve any remissions. We didn't achieve any resolution associated with tumors, but we did demonstrate that we could modify the immune response in the host, that's in the human, and we could able, if we were persistent in our, our thoughts, we should be able to beget uh, a different way of doing it. We treated about uh, 12 patients with this, and at the end, there really was not much more to learn other than we could do it, it was safe, it had the ability to stimulate immunity, but it never reached the levels that we needed to or the targets that we needed to. So we turned, or at least uh, everybody has been turned to vaccines, vaccine therapy. We knew there were antigens. We could create vaccines that contain those antigens, much in the same way as we create vaccines for hepatitis B or hepatitis A, um, and, and administer those vaccines to stimulate. We've taken a bit more of a step on that thing, which is to engage the dendritic cell in providing that vaccine. And I'll, I'll show you where, where we've, we've uh, tried to enhance that stimulation of the immune response, specific immune response against tumor antigens. <clears throat> because what we wanted to do here is to stimulate in metastatic melanoma an, an immune response against one of the tumor antigens. This is a, a glycoprotein 100, GP100. So to do that, we made an adenovirus, just like we talked about before, that incorporated the gene expressing GP100. So we now have that adenovirus ready, and it'll infect and make GP100. But we wanted to expand the ability of that vector to stimulate immunity, and to do that, we, we uh, generated the patient's own dendritic cell population. So the patient uh, would receive a bolus of GCSF to mobilize the bone marrow. They were freezed. Uh, we'd isolate the precursor cell, the, the stem cell population for the dendritic cell, culture that in the laboratory for about 12 days. And at the end of that, we had a population of the patient's own dendritic cells. We infected those with the vectors expressing GP100. So now we have a vaccine, their own dendritic cells, with the GP100 antigen and putting that back into the, to the patient. This, uh, again, uh, didn't lead to any regressions, uh, did not lead to remissions. Um, the most common outcome was an enhanced uh, 
period of uh, life for the patient. Some of them are still alive. We don't know why. We were able to demonstrate definitely that we generated immune responses, but we never really got to grips with this approach. We never got to the heightened approach of uh, being able to demonstrate clearly uh, an impact, an overall impact on the melanoma. We did another trial uh, using a different vector. This is using a herpes vector. It's a bigger vector, had more space in it. We could incorporate, in this case, three different tumor antigens, GP100, MART, and tyrosinase. Again, these are molecules that we had well known over the many years as being overexpressed on, uh, on melanoma. Um, uh, again, we proved that it was a safe process. We could run these immunizations over the period of time. The patients had very few adverse reactions. Uh, we were able to demonstrate clearly that we were stimulating the immune response not high enough, not strong enough, and not prolonged enough. But a few steps further on. Now, I should say when I say we, it's a royal we. It's the others who, uh, who carried a lot of this work through. But also around the world, a number of laboratories were also trying to for, uh, push forward on uh, cell-based vaccines. This is really personalized medicine. You take the patient's own cell population, you educate that cell population, and put it back into them. And you'll see that, in fact, that's led to a, a slightly different change, but the same principle is, uh, is involved. We did get some results, as you see here, uh, with uh, scans where at the pre uh, and post levels, we did demonstrate the removal of some of the tumor and, and modify the tumor growth, but we re never really saw total regression or total treatments. So this is a, sort of a, a summary of the uh, multiple trials that we have carried out when, with that kind of approach at McMaster. We've uh, the adenovirus expressing IL-2, uh, dendritic cells loaded uh, with the melanoma antigens, uh, RNA loaded dendritic cells in BCLL, uh, which uh, we ran with an American company associated with it, um, adenovirus loaded uh, uh, dendritic cells with the HER2 gene uh, in breast cancer, and with the uh, PSA gene in uh, peptide loaded dendritic cells. Each time we did the trials, we learned more. We know that we're stimulating the immune response. We also know that we've got limitations in understanding the human immune response. It is not the same as the mouse, uh, surprising. Uh, but uh, until we get to grips with the fact as to how we measure the immune response, it's not simply do you have an antibody present or what's a titer of the antibody. You actually have to do con some considerable uh, cell biology in order to understand whether you have the right kind of immunity uh, being generated. Uh, these were all safe, um, and they did educate us towards a direction that uh, hopefully will lead eventually to the right kind of stimulation, the right targets of the stimulation. So there was one FDA-approved uh, cancer vaccine, dendritic cell-based uh, dendrion uh, called Provenge. It uh, was targeted against uh, prostate antigen, uh, prostate cancer. It's not all that uh, effective, but it has effects in, in a number of patients. Uh, but this was the first of the vaccine trials. We were not able to, to duplicate many of the outcomes trying to use it uh, with our own dendritic cells, but at least it got past uh, FDA. It had enough uh, underlying principles correct for the approach to get approval, and the movement forward uh, has actually allowed many other companies to enter in uh, subsequently using slightly different approaches. So. Uh, as a pioneer, this is the one that got the cell-based vaccines going. Okay, <clears throat> a little bit of step back to that T cell population, and, and, and the understanding grew over the last 20 years about what the T cell sees, binds to, and is stimulated by. So on your left, um, there are a number of, of receptors that are on the T cell that receive positive signals. So if they get engaged, they stimulate the T cell population. And equally, on the right-hand side, there are a number of receptors expressed by the T cell that if they get engaged, they stimulate a negative response. There is a yin and a yang associated with control of the immune response. That's actually understandable now. We don't want an unfettered immune response because autoimmunity can, can occur. And autoimmunity is not something that we want to, uh, to um, attest to. So the positives and negatives are the balancing act of the T cell population. But knowing that has led us down a pretty interesting pathway. 
So if we go back to that, again, the photomicrograph where you have the tumor cell and the T cell population, and we know the communication occurs, one of those communications is the fact that the T cell expresses that negative receptor. The tumor cell can engage that negative receptor, and as a result, stop the T cell proliferating. It's the way in which the immune blockade occurs. So that is one of the mechanisms how tumors evade, how they stop the T cell. They provide the negative signals and not the positive signals for the stimulation. And the two that have got the most notice right now, is in, and in fact the two that uh, if you are in any kind of uh, therapeutic uh, treatment uh, for some of your patients, you may well now begin to see these, are the uh, CTLA-4 antibody and the PD-1 antibody. These two uh, areas of negative regulation of T cells um, have received a tremendous amount of attention because they work. That is, interfering with them works. It removes the blockade and causes stimulation of the immune response against the tumors. So this is immune checkpoint inhibitors, and uh, they are out there now. They have received FDA approval. Uh, they will be in use. Uh, some of your patients may well be in trials now uh, undertaking some of these um, uh, molecules, but they are the immune checkpoint inhibitors. They block the ability of the tumor to block the activation of the T cell population. <clears throat> So if that occurs, then we, and then we can get that uh, car, um, thing to work. And the anti-TCLA4 and, and PD-1, those are the names of the individual monoclonal antibodies that are beginning to be on the market right now. Uh, a combination of the two has really showed remarkable activity in melanoma. Um, tremendous uh, activity, so much so that uh, many of the, of the trials have been stopped because of a very positive outcome and a comparison associated with it. But they don't come cheap, number one cost, but nor do they come without their own side effects. And they come with side effects because what we didn't realize is that um, uh, organs like the pancreas and the intestine uh, and the pituitary actually involve the same kind of signaling mechanisms. You never knew that until you do the trials and the trials tell you that you have to be careful because some of these side effects uh, one has to be are cognizant of and, and not allow them to engage to too high of a level. So there are toxicity is still associated with this, but nothing like the toxicity associated with, uh, with um, chemotherapy. So just a, a quick scan of the time frame. So 1987, you cloned the CTLA-4 gene. We knew what it was. We knew how it, its function was. Um, up to the FDA approval in 2011. Very rapid, necessarily. A biologic. A monoclonal antibody, um, we're now going to get involved in those monoclonal antibodies being available, but they're going to be also copied. So you're going to be seeing biosimilars that are coming out. This is a so-called word that's being used for the generic form of monoclonal antibody therapies. That's going to drive the cost down, so it's going to become much more relevant in your future practices for individuals who are going to be exposed to many of these uh, individual molecules. PD-1 wasn't cloned until about 1992, but it received uh, FDA approval in uh, 2015. These are really uh, coming on the market, uh, and the patients will begin to get them. Um, again, cost is quite high, but if they work, then you've in induced an immune response which is protective, presumably, for many, many years because the immune response can continue to be stimulated uh, over, over years and years, as opposed to uh, trying to wipe out every single cell with a chemotherapeutic approach. Can we do this possibly in the dish? Can we, do it, can we do it outside of the body framework? Can we take those T cells and instead of trying to block, um, undo the blockade, we'll, we will still do that, or un, instead of trying to introduce the antigens, can we modify the T cells in the dish? This is now the, mo the most active area of, uh, of investigation and the most active area of development of new approaches. So can you awaken that killer spirit so it'll kill the cell when you put those T cells back into the, uh, the human? Again, this is personalized medicine. We're talking about using the individual's T cell populations and educating them in the lab and putting them back in. So how do we do that? Well, we again go back to my virology. We get educated from HIV, for example, um, uh, a lentivirus that will introduce 
and incorporate, integrated uh, into the genome of the background, incorporate the um, a molecule that we want. If we cripple that uh, the, the virus, we cripple, we take out the pathogenic uh, virus genome, and we insert instead sequences that are for a good protein, in this case, we know what we will put in, then that, that individual vector down there can become a way in which we introduce genes from a long period of time into a cell population. Okay. So to do that, we take T cells out of the patient, we put them into the cell culture, we use the lentivirus expressing the gene that we want, we put that into the patient T cell, and now that T cell is expressing what we want. It's now been educated. And if we educate it correctly, it should recognize the tumors and be able to kill them. Okay. So what are we going to put in? Well, it's been very difficult to understand how best to do this, but now we've rebuilt molecules. And this is the so-called chimeric antigen receptor. This is going to result in a, a, mol or a cell population called a CAR T cell. You may have read about it in the newspaper because it has been published quite heavily in the New York Times. But the CAR is this chimeric antigen receptor. It's put together from pieces of molecules. The molecule at the top end is an antibody, a piece of an antibody that recognizes the antigen. And then we have uh, membrane spanning uh, pieces that would allow it to get inserted in the membrane of the T cell. And below that in the CD30, uh, CD3 uh, zeta range, that's a signaling molecule. So we built these and insert them now by using a lentivirus to take that built genome into the T cell, now the T cell expresses it. And this is just a configuration of, of, of how you do it. You uh, take the CD28 uh, molecule, uh, revamp it so you take only the uh, specificities of it, and then put that into the tumor cell for the killing. So collect the individual's T cell population, uh, expand that in vitro, grow a lot of them, infect it with uh, the lentivirus expressing the individual CAR receptor, and then you've got an ability to put them back into the individual. You can either do that with or without removal or depletion of the individual's T cell population in the first place. This has been a very successful approach recently, very successful in a limited number of tumors, but so successful as to be remarkable. And this is the, some of the the recent articles out of in lymphoma and leukemia, uh, where a CAR T cell de demonstrated against a marker on the uh, leukemia cell population, CD19, uh, transferred into cell population, expanded those, and put those back into the patients, dramatic, dramatic clearance of leukemias. Um, so much so that in many cases, there is no residual, apparently, uh, so that we've been able to generate a prolonged exposure to uh, or prolonged uh, capacity to manage the individual T cell population. Unfortunately, as everything, there's a side effect. The side effect in this case is that many of these cells that engage the individual tumor release a ton of uh, active molecules. The active molecules are called cytokines again, and we end up getting a so-called cytokine storm. We can control that, uh, but it, it does uh, give rise to a problem. So this is called the adoptive T cell therapy uh, approach. Uh, and you heard previously about the immune checkpoint blockade. These are in the public domain. They're now, <clears throat> uh, the public reads about them. If they Google anything, it'll come up. So you will undoubtedly get confronted by patients who come in and say, what do you know about A, B, C, or D? And these are the A, B, C, and Ds that you have to know. So the take home message is that we can do it. We can manipulate the immune response. We can rebuild T cell specificity and put that all back in. But it doesn't work. Uh, really without uh, toxicity associated with it. So in the last uh, little bit is the newest stuff, the, the, the new approach, which makes use of all of our principles that we learned previously, but adds a little twist. And the little twist down the bottom there is oncolytic virotherapy. We've known for many years that there are certain viruses that if they get exposed to a tumor, they will kill the tumor. Now, how does that occur? Well, in being, becoming a tumor, Tumor cells modify their signaling capacity so that they can self-replicate. And in doing so, they open up a vulnerability, which most normal cells have. They have the ability to mount an interferon response. So when a virus gets into a normal cell population, the normal cell will mount an interferon response and control the replication of that virus in that cell. 
Tumor cells, a number of them, do not. They have lost that capacity. And so a normally innocuous virus, one which we would not have much of a response, is been able to actually kill the individual tumor. So a replication-competent virus that preferably infects and replicates in cancer cells to direct the killing of cancer cells. So vaccinia is one that's been used now, uh, clinical trials. Uh, rhabdoviruses are the new ones that I'm going to describe a little bit to you. Um, and, and this is a very fascinating new field because it quite clearly it's dramatic, the outcome, once you inject the virus. This is the newest one called Maraba. Um, there's a big hunt on around the world for many of these new viruses. Uh, this one comes from Brazil, uh, isolated from sandflies in Brazil, but it has a mar marvelous capacity to infect and kill a very large number of different tumor types uh, in vitro, and now the trials are going on with using this individual in vivo. So how does it work? Well, an individual virus coming in, the oncolytic virus, goes into a normal cell population, and nothing happens except replication. Uh, they don't die, they replicate, and they spit out the individual virus, so we can enhance the amount. That individual virus can then infect the tumor cell population, and in the tumor cell population, the replication results in killing of that material. So it's, it's a tremendous way of figuring out how to debulk tumors uh, at the same time as not harming the normal cell population. Um, it's already have one virus of WINS uh, approval uh, from FDA, and, and, and there's probably six or seven different clinical trials on now with different uh, oncolytic viruses that are going, uh, uh, coming on the market. So the last approach is, is, is the, uh, taking those principles but now combining them because this is the most recent trial that's going on in Canada. The, an oncolytic virus, we know that that's capable of blocking and debulking, if you like, tumors. But if, again, you go back and modify that virus, if you add into that virus, for example, tumor antigen, genes, that virus will not only infect, will express tumor antigen genes and act primarily as a vaccine, same way that we've done it by using an adenovirus and taking that same tumor antigen. So if we combine these approaches, we, where, where we're using the immune response to stimulate the immune response and using the oncolytic approach to not only debulk but introduce antigens in a booster manner, we think that we're going to get the most uh, powerful outcome that's present. So a priming vaccine with a tumor antigen, for example, a prostate antigen. Priming vaccine would be an adenovirus with the prostate antigen in it. So we would give those to the patients. We'd then come back after a period of time with a um, a tumor antigen, the same tumor antigen, incorporated now into an oncolytic virus, in this case the Maraba virus. So that not only do we get debulking, but we get boosters. And you know that in immunizations, primaries are slow and boosters are fast because they engage the memory T cell populations. So this is going to get, as we believe, the best bang for our buck. There's a phase 2A uh, clinical trial undergoing right now out of uh, Ottawa, uh, uh, Toronto and Hamilton, um, in which there is going to be an uh, oncolytic virus expressing a tumor antigen alone, ARM1, um, a virus, in case, this case an adenovirus, expressing a tumor antigen in ARM2, or the combination in ARM3, and the modifying the monof uh, monitoring of those individual patients uh, is an important component. This was uh, good enough to get, to get us on TV. Um, uh, this is work that's really uh, pioneered out of Ottawa, uh, John Bell and, and Brian Lichty. Uh, but it does say that this is now the, the world's first. Uh, so Canada is, is not lagging behind in, in terms of many of the things that we've got. The oncolytic area is very hot, in, in, uh, uh, certainly in the province of Ontario, uh, but also engaging it across the country. So this is no, the, the newest trial we think is going to have a major impact on the development of immunity and the management of uh, immune therapies. And in reality, we've got several organizations across the country. Um, this is just one, the Ontario Regional Biotherapeutics Program, supported by the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research, YCR. But each and every one of the things that I've just described is being tried. So there are cell-based vaccines that we can, the dendritic cell vaccines. There's oncolytic viruses that are being tried. 
Um, and there's uh, adoptive cellular therapies, T cell, CAR T cells, etc. These are all under investigation, all at phase one, two uh, trial uh, outcomes, engaging uh, companies as well as uh, academic centers. Uh, it's a very, very exciting time because for the first time in arguably 15 to 20 years, we're beginning to see results. We're beginning to see outcomes that we'd hoped to see previously, but now we know what we're trying to do. We're trying to stimulate the right kind of cell population, or we're arming that right kind of cell population with the kind of manipulations that are present. So this is it. This is the renaissance of immunotherapy. Uh, I've taken you all the way up to about 2011, 2015. There's many, many more developments that are going to occur, and they are definitely going to impact you, either directly as a patient uh, or indirectly as you uh, treating your, your individual patients, because these are now uh, effective and going to be coming very rapidly onto the market. So um, I'll stop there at that point. Thank you. We have time for several questions. If uh, this is a very uh, uh, up to date, and I realize we don't all have the same knowledge that Dr. Baldwin has. <laughs> Thank you for a fascinating talk. I just have one question, and, and I don't know if it's overly simplistic, but when you talked about the oncolytic viruses, you said they affect some tumors but not others. Mm. And my question is, does that have anything to do with? the same protective features that are expressed against the killer cells, is there something about some tumors that affect the ability of the viruses to infect those cells? Um, <clears throat> so it's not so much that they don't inf infect the tumor cells, it's that not all tumor cells have modified the signaling pathways on which the oncolytic virus relies. So when an oncolytic virus gets in, it can replicate and kill the, or lies the cell uh, but it has to have that abnormality in the signaling pathways. Not all tumors have that abnormality. They have evolved slightly different abnormalities in the pathways. They might be susceptible to different viruses as well. So there's a, a big learning curve right now, uh, but it is clear that, for example, Maraba, at least half a dozen different tumor forms are, are modified by, uh, by that virus alone. By sheer coincidence, I, I have a very good friend who is, who's been treating, uh, been treated by this with a melanoma. You mentioned melanomas at first, then you, uh, now you change it to leukemia mm. as being more effective. And uh, what I'm wondering is each treatment costs uh, a horrendous amount of money, so the whole family is sort of gathering money. Why are they so expensive? <laughs> I wish I, I mean, uh, <clears throat> you have to ask the the, the company. First, first of all, um, to do a, a to personalized medicine one, which in take the take the patient, take the cells out, culture it in the thing, and then make a product that goes back in the vaccine. Uh, that's expensive in terms of time, uh, laboratories, etc. Not as expensive as the number that's touted in, in the multi thousand dollars, or multi tens of thousand dollars in terms of the treatments. Uh, companies are attempting to reco recoup uh, uh, their investments. Uh, you know, this is not unique to this type of approach. Uh, most of the new drugs coming on the market, most of the new biologicals are going to be in the tens of thousands in terms of treatments. Uh, government's going to have to get involved in terms of uh, modifying the... But it comes from the companies. It's not the steps that, that are so difficult. It's the, it comes from the companies, these high prices, the, spending 30000 for one treatment. And yeah, that, well, we don't sell anything in the academic range, so the companies make it, um, mm -hmm. have it protected, and it, it is expensive, but I'm not certain it's as expensive as, as what, they're, uh, what they're charging. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Goldie. A ex vivo expansion of T cells um, yeah. had been a problem. W yeah. What's occurring now that uh, allows it to be done successfully? Uh, discoveries of the right kind of media, the right kind of stimuli that uh, one incorporates into the population, the right kind of uh, vessels, uh, microcarriers that have now changed how we can get T cells to grow. Uh, it was a, a, a big barrier, uh, but now uh, I think it's, it's getting towards a routine now where you can expect over a period of five to 10 days to get an expansion 
that will allow you to reinfuse back into a patient under under GMP conditions, where where you get the excuse me the sealed uh, sealed bag of uh, of expansion. So uh, it's taken a long time. Um, we, you, you're right; you could never really get a a T cell expansion to the kind of levels that we want because you got to go maybe. Uh, a thousand population doublings before you get to the, the levels of reinfusement, but uh, that's been overcome. So at least, uh, um, and most of it under the growth media conditions and uh, and the stimulation that's gone on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Goldie. Uh, I have a few questions, and I apologize if they are too technical. I'm an immunologist myself, so this talk kind of gave me few interesting points. Uh, first, with the CAR therapy, uh, I, from my knowledge, it only works as long as the antigen is on the surface of the cancer cell. So if does that create a, a limitation on its use? And if it does, how, how far can we take CAR therapy to treating cancers? And uh, my second question is with the oncolytic viruses is if with re re repeated administration to patients, mm. if they mount an immune response to it, mm. then they stop being effective. Yeah. Also, if you want them to infect the cell and express antigen inside the cell, but an artifact or a side effect of the administration process, you end up, for example, mounting a Th2 immune response, not a Th1, then that person will no longer be able to kill the tumor cells. Yeah, so uh, t two things. Uh, I mean, the CAR T cell uh, approach you know, you've picked, or at least a number of people have picked up on it. Um, so far, it's been working very well for liquid tumors. It's not been very good for solid tumors. We don't really know yet how to get it, either access to the solid tumor, correct access, or, or what, but that's an area of investigation to the things. Um, when you engage a CAR T cell into an antigen uh, on a T cell population, or on a tumor population, uh, it should kill that tumor. It should not allow that tumor to evolve and evade and, and uh, generate another mutation of that same antigen. It's not to say it would not work, but we're expecting with the amount of, um, of killing capacity that the T cell population has, it, we should be able to debulk and, and remove those uh, individual tumor cells. But yes, you, it could escape. So it's not just about the escape, it's the, the how many different types of cancers can we no. treat? Because not all of them express no. CD19, which is... No. Yeah. So, so there are limited numbers of patients that respond. Not all patients are responding, uh, but well over 20 percent at least uh, have had evidence of the response, which is maybe 10 times what we would see with many of our other previous uh, issues. We don't yet know why the other uh, 80 percent or, or uh, 60 percent don't respond, but it's been remarkable in those that did respond. So it's probably telling us that we haven't got the right antigen on all the others. Uh, we haven't figured out which is the best target antigen for that, um, but that would be the, where many of the investigations are going right now. In terms of the oncolytic virus, you're absolutely right. These are pathogenic organisms. Once you introduce it into the host, the host is not only going to respond against the things that you're putting in, but it's also going to mount an immune response against that pathogenic organism. So you can administer, for example, Mirabba once. But, but if you come back and try to administer it on a second or third occasion, you get a booster response against the Mirabba. Uh, so that's the limitations of many of the, uh, the viral mediated systems that we use to, to introduce. And the same thing for the adenovirus. You can only really administer it over, uh, once or at most twice under, on, and expect to get, uh, uh, to get a response for it. Thank you. What are the side effects? Sorry? What are the side effects of the treatment? So the side effects are, again, um, many, of the, many of these immune interventions give rise to immune activation. And immune activation usually results in hyperactivation of uh, inflammatory cells, uh, such that they release into the circulation many potent molecules like uh, interferons, interferon alpha and beta, uh, uh, interleukin-6, interleukin-1, tumor necrosis factor, many of these cytokines in a so-called cytokine storm. So one gets not, not multi-organ failure, but multi-organ involvement in an enhanced inflammatory response. One is, there, people are moving now to use anti-cytokine therapy concomitant with it to try and block those, and that that's, has uh, quite a lot of pluses associated with it. 
Um, and, and we also have to use anti-inflammatory treatment at the same time to try and dampen it down. So recognition of what it is and what, what's giving rise to it has allowed us actually to be able to, to mitigate it by, uh, by de de designing another secondary inter intervention that will control the, the, the side effects. Thank you very much.